Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our study of the Gospel of Mark on this first Sunday of February 2021. I know that some of you are early risers and you watch this at 6.30 on Sunday mornings when it premieres. Others of you maybe start watching around 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, some on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening. Maybe some of you will be watching this later in the week. I'm convinced that there are some people who will come across this lesson weeks from now or months from now. So whichever is the case for you, uh, thank you for devoting this time. Thank you for devoting your heart and mind and spirit uh, to the reading and the study of God's Word. And I'm grateful for another opportunity for us to look at Mark's gospel together. We'll be picking up this morning in Mark chapter 6, verse 14. And the first two words that we encounter in the NIV in Mark 6.14 are the words King Herod. This is not the King Herod that we encounter early in Matthew's gospel. Uh, the, the King Herod who learns from the Magi who have come from the east uh, that they have come to Jerusalem looking for the one who has been born King of the Jews so that they might worship him. Uh, sadly, uh, Herod the Great's uh, typical sad, megalomaniac, paranoid response is to seek the life of the child when the Magi go back another way and, and don't tell him where they have found the child. Uh, and then numerous male children, uh, two years old and, and younger, are slaughtered in the environs of, of Bethlehem. That was Herod the Great. The Herod that we read about here is one of his sons, and I guess I should say one of his surviving sons, which not all of them were. Because Herod the Great was so paranoid, because he was so jealous, because he guarded his rule and his reign uh, so carefully, he had three of his sons put to death when he thought that they were a threat to his rule. He had one of his wives put to death as well. And so this is one of the surviving sons. Um, he has a brother, surviving brother named Archelaus who ruled in his father's place initially. He has a brother named Herod Philip who comes into the story very, very soon. So this is Herod Antipas, uh, the same Herod before whom Jesus will appear when he is on trial. So we're told in verse 14 that King Herod heard about this. What does he hear about? He hears about what Jesus is doing, and he hears about what Jesus's disciples are doing, that he has sent out two by two. We read about that beginning in verse 6 of, of chapter 6. Um, but he hears about all these things because the name of Jesus has become well known, and there were divided opinions as to who he was, who Jesus was, and what Herod is fearful of is this speculation that it might be John the Baptist uh, who has returned from the dead. It, it was back in chapter uh, 1, verse 14, that we read that uh, John had been arrested, that, that he had been put in prison. At that point, we're not told why. Uh, but some were saying that Jesus is John the Baptist who has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him, which is really interesting because while Jesus did incredible miracles, wonders, and signs by the power of the Spirit, according to John chapter 10, verse 1, John the Baptist didn't perform any signs. Uh, he preached a message of repentance, the nearness of the kingdom of God, this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but John didn't heal anyone. He didn't cast out any demons. He didn't raise the dead. He didn't walk on water. He didn't multiply food. John performed no signs in contrast, stark contrast to Jesus. So it's interesting to me that in response to Jesus doing all these things and people hearing about it, some people assume that maybe it was John come back from the dead. Uh, others said he is Elijah. Now, while uh, John the Baptist, is, it's interesting that he didn't perform miracles and signs because he was filled with the Spirit uh, from the time he was in his mother's womb. Uh, according to the word of Gabriel to Zechariah, his father, uh, when his birth was foretold, uh, his son would have the Spirit and the power of Elijah. Uh, the Old Testament scripture 
the book of Malachi, chapter 4, ver verse 5, the Old, Tes Old Testament canon of Scripture, closes with this prophecy, this expectation that Elijah would come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Uh, it's not clear to them yet. Uh, Jesus will make it clear to his disciples that indeed John was Elijah who was to come. Not Elijah himself, but one with Elijah's spirit and one with Elijah's power. So some people say of Jesus, maybe it's John the Baptist come back from the dead. Uh, maybe it's, it's Elijah. Uh, others know he's just a prophet like one of the prophets long ago. Uh, one of the, the writing prophets, perhaps, uh, maybe one of the, the non-writing prophets. But Herod has his strongest suspicion in that this might be John the Baptist come back from the dead, and that greatly troubles him because he was the one responsible for John's death. Verse 16, when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. And then Mark gives us the backstory. He gives us the explanation. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested. Remember back in Mark 1.14, we're told John was taken into custody. And he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. Um, if I could show you a diagram of the family tree of the Herodians, uh, it would make you dizzy with lines going every which direction. Uh, there has never been a sordid story. There has never been a soap opera that was more contorted, that was more twisted than the, the story of the relationships within the Herodian family. And um, Herodias, was actually a niece of both Herod Philip and Herod Antipas. She was the daughter of another brother, one of those brothers that had been put to death by their father. And initially, this niece marries Herod Philip, but then she falls in love with his brother, uh, Herod Antipas. And so she divorces Herod Philip in order to marry him. So understand uh, it's his former sister-in-law, and it is his niece to whom he is married. And John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Uh, while some men, like Herod, had multiple wives, a woman wasn't to have multiple husbands. She divorced Herod Philip so that she could marry Herod Antipas. Uh, so Herodias nursed a grudge against John. Uh, she didn't like that kind of press. She didn't like the fact that in the preaching of this man out in the wilderness, her name kept coming up and Herod's name kept coming up. So she nursed a grudge against John, wanted to kill him. This is not just an irritation to her. And she is sort of the counterpart uh, to Jezebel. If you remember King Ahab's wife, Jezebel, and the hatred that she had for Elijah, her attempts to kill Elijah. Well, now here comes the one who has Elijah's spirit and Elijah's power, and there's another wife of a king. There's another queen uh, who wants to, to kill him. Uh, she was not able to do so, however, because Herod feared John and he protected him. Sadly, we're going to find later in the story that he feared Herodias more than he feared John, but for the time being, he keeps him in custody, wants to protect him because he knows John to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, and then, this is just amazing to me. He was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. We, we sort of get the... Um, indication here that while John was in custody, Herod would have audiences with him. He would have John brought in, and he would hear him, and he liked to hear what he said. John's preaching about righteousness. John's preaching uh, about um, the nearness of the kingdom of God and the need for repentance. It didn't move Herod to do what he needed to do, but for some reason, 
uh, he, he still likes to listen to him. Reminds me a lot of the Roman governor Felix in regard to Paul. And I think uh, I'm recording this earlier in the week. Uh, it's actually Tuesday evening when I'm recording this. I think the sermon on Sunday is, is going to, to play on this. That's my intention at, at this point as well. So I'll be referring to this again in the worship hour during the, the sermon. But beginning in verse 24 of Acts chapter 24, several days later, Felix, the Roman governor Felix, came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. At that same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Now, there was this ulterior, ulterior motive of, of wanting to be paid off by Paul so that he could be released, but there were numerous occasions when he would call for him and, and listen to him and talk with him. It re reminds me of exactly of what Herod is doing with John. Finally, verse 21 says, the opportune time came. Not an opportune time for John, an opportune time for Herodias. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet. As far as I know, there's only one other birthday party mentioned in, in Scripture, and it's another king. It's Pharaoh, king of Egypt, uh, in Genesis chapter 40. And uh, once again, this king has this birthday celebration. And it's not just a small gathering of close friends. This is a big deal. This is a huge occasion. He gave a banquet for his high officials. These are governmental officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. Military men, politicians, uh, prominent citizens, uh, business people, rich people from Galilee, they're all gathered there for Herod's birthday. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guest. History tells us that Herodias's daughter's name was Salome, and this dance that she performs is, is not some cute little folk dance. Uh, it, is in, it is intended to entice. It is intended to arouse and, and to please uh, emotionally, the, these men who are gathered there and gawking at her as, as she dances. And uh, remember that this is Herod's stepdaughter as well as his great niece. Uh, not only is, is Herod Antipas an adulterer, he's, he's just a flat out creep. And he is so pleased by, by uh, Salome's dance that he says to her, ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. That could have been some kind of idle boast. Half his kingdom was a lot. Uh, he had a lot of power. He had a lot of authority. Uh, it's probably just the case that, that he's showing off, but, but he writes her, he hands her this blank check and ask her to, to fill it out. And she doesn't know what to put on it. So she goes and asks her mother. I don't think Salome had any idea what her mother was going to say. Uh, she just wanted some, some counsel on what to ask Herod Antipas for. And her mother says, the head of John the Baptist, I'm sure Herodias thinks, I can't believe that this, this is happening. I have wanted him dead for so long, and, and Herod wouldn't do it uh, because he, he protects him. He shields him from me, but here's my opportunity. At once, and, and we don't know how old Salome uh, was, uh, still fairly young. I, I think she was probably shocked by her mother's request, but she passes it on. At once, the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. I'm thoroughly convinced that Herod did not see this coming. 
Uh, had he seen it coming, he never would have made the boast. He never would have made the offer. And we're, we're told that, that he was greatly distressed. He's stunned. He, he's torn with this intense inner conflict because he doesn't want John dead, but he doesn't want to be embarrassed in front of these, these nobles. And pride is at work and position is at work and status is at work. Um, yes, he feared John, we were told, but he feared Herodias more. He feared losing face more. He feared humiliation more. And, and brothers and sisters, this is just a, a great lesson to us. If you make a stupid vow, don't feel obligated uh, to keep it. Uh, if you make a promise that, that is contrary to, to what is ethical and what is moral, by all means, don't keep that promise. Uh, and yet, Herod doesn't have the moral backbone to do that. Uh, the king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, doesn't want to lose face in front of them. He did not want to refuse her. So he, <coughs> excuse me, he, he fulfills the request. Immediately, he sends an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. You know, you can't imagine the mood change that, that came about at that banquet. At that, up, up until now, it's been raucous, probably drunken celebration, and then the erotic dance of, of Salome, and, and then her request that she comes back with from, from her mother, and then a man's head being brought into that banquet room on a platter, and it being given to Salome and her taking it to her mother. Uh, John's disciples, I, I can't imagine the, the, the emotional trauma that they're going through when they hear uh, that their teacher uh, the one who had baptized them, the one who had taught them, the one who had pointed them to Jesus has been put to, de uh, put to death. And when they go to retrieve his body, it is only his body that they retrieve, his headless body. Uh, but they show great courage. I mean, th their leader has just been killed and they're brave enough, they're bold enough, they're courageous enough to go ask for his body to identify themselves with him. <laughs> Excuse me, brothers and sisters. Um, let me get another sip of water. It reminds me of, of what the men of Jabesh Gilead did in 1 Samuel chapter 31. After Saul and three of his sons are put to death by the Philistines and their bodies are hung on, on the walls of, of the city of Beth Shan, the men of Jabesh Gilead hear about that and they march all through the night to retrieve their bodies and, and give them uh, a burial. And that's what uh, John's disciples do here. So, and, and we're going to encounter uh, Herod Antipas again in, in the story of, of Jesus in um, Luke chapter 13. We're told that <clears throat> men come from, actually Pharisees, <clears throat> I am so very sorry. I'm, I'm tempted to, to stop this and start over again, but uh, just I'll ask for your understanding and your compassion as I work through this, this tickle in my throat. In Luke chapter 13, ver verse 31, it says, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. This is long before the, the betrayal uh, of, of Judas, of his teacher and his master. Uh, Herod, who has already put John the Baptist to death, decides that he wants Jesus dead as well. And then during the trial of Jesus, before Pilate, when Pilate learns that Jesus is from Galilee, he sends him over to, to Herod Antipas, who was also in town. 
uh, also in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And there we learn in Luke chapter 23 that, that Herod was excited when Jesus was sent to him because he had been wanting to see him for a long time, wanting to see some sign performed by him. He'd heard about these signs. He wants to see it for himself. Jesus gives him nothing. But even before that, Herod wants him dead. So when, when Jesus learns about all this, it, it, it had to have been uh, emotionally traumatic for him. Uh, John was his best man. He was his best friend. He was his forerunner, the one who prepared the way uh, for him, not to mention his relative in the flesh, his cousin who was six months older than he. Uh, verse 30 of Mark 6, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Remember back in verse 12 of chapter 6, uh, the, the, the disciples go out two by two. They preach that people should repent. They drove out many demons, anoint many sick people with oil, and hear, uh, healed them. Now they've come back, and they're reporting all of these things to, to Jesus. Uh, I don't know how long they've been gone but uh, they're, they're probably fatigued, worn, uh, worn out. Jesus is constantly uh, having demands made upon him. So Jesus thinks, you know, it's time for a retreat. It's time for us to get away. Verse 31, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Uh, brothers and sisters, that's what we've got to do sometimes. We weren't meant uh, for 24-7 living. Um, God created the Sabbath, uh, set aside the Sabbath for a reason. Uh, everybody needs a break. And even though that is not legislated and mandated anymore as an observance of the seventh day, uh, our need for respite and rest and refreshment uh, is, is ongoing. And we have to be disciplined to do that. The world isn't going to do it for us. The church isn't even going to do it for us. Uh, we've got to do that for ourselves. Uh, we've got to set some boundaries. We've got to be disciplined in making sure that mentally, physically, emotionally, uh, spiritually, we are being refreshed. We are finding times of respite. Um, that plan doesn't work out for them uh, at this time, just like it doesn't work out for us sometimes. Verse 32, they went away by themselves in a boat, wanting to be undetected, but they're not undetected. They went by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot uh, from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd you know, if this were the story of Tim and, and that had happened to me under those circumstances, I don't know if Mark couldn't have, I don't think Mark could have written the story as he writes it. You know, when Tim landed and saw a large crowd, he just lost it. Uh, he, he blew his top. Um, why can't, you know, can I not have a moment's rest? Jesus is, is so much more compassionate than Tim. Uh, Jesus is, is so much uh, more the, the epitome of a shepherd than Tim, because when he sees the crowds, he doesn't think about himself. He doesn't think about his own needs. He thinks about their needs, and he has compassion on them. Um, Tim would have been thinking about himself. Jesus thinks about the crowd, uh, that they were like sheep without a shepherd, not somebody to tell them physically uh, where to go. They needed someone to lead them spiritually, and that's why Jesus began to teach them many things. That's the kind of leadership. That's the kind of guidance they needed, and he teaches and teaches until the day is almost gone. Verse 35, by this time, it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him. Uh, this is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. In the mind of the disciples, the hunger of these people uh, was not their problem. Uh, the hunger of these people was those people's problem, not the disciples. 
And I, I'm, I'm so grateful um, over these last several years, I guess coming up on the 11th year now, maybe the, the 12th year this summer, what started as 50 days of, of food and fun and then soon became New Heights Summer Camp. All that started because there were some people, uh, Colleen Detheridge in particular, who accepted the fact that someone else's hunger uh, was her business. Someone else's hunger uh, was her problem and our concern as a congregation, which it, which it is. And that's when we got hooked in with the uh, summer food service program with the USDA and started serving uh, for eight weeks in the summer, a uh, hot nutritious breakfast and a hot nutritious lunch. And then the academic enrichment program was developed to go along with that and daily Bible instruction. And, and that ministry has been such a blessing. And a part of all of it is this thing we learned from Jesus, uh, that it is our concern when other people don't have what they need to eat. And, and for that same reason, I love our food pantry and, and the hard work, uh, the, the dedication, uh, the literal sweat that, that goes into that ministry every single week. Um, and Terry Larson and Laura Copeland and, and everybody else who works in that ministry because they believe that other people's hunger is, is their concern, uh, that, that it, is, it is a difficulty, it's a challenge, it's a problem to which we can provide a solution as a congregation. Uh, so thank you everyone who is involved, involved in both of those ministries. Thank you Broken Arrow Church for supporting those ministries uh, with your time, with your donations, uh, with, with your monetary donations, and uh, with, with your assistance. Um, so they say, you know, Jesus, send them away. Uh, they're, they're hungry. Let them figure that out. And Jesus answers, you give them something to eat. You may not think their hunger is your problem, but it is your problem. You give them something to eat. And because we know the rest of the story, it's hard for us to feel the tension here uh, that, that, that immediately flared up. Uh, you know, they, they say to him, uh, let me check time here, which I did not start my stopwatch, so I've got no idea how long we've been going. I'm going to guess we've been going about 17, 18 minutes. I'll... I'll um, I'll move forward with that assumption, and uh, I'll find out very soon after the class is over. But they said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to, to them to eat? Literally in the text, uh, I would take more than 200 denarii. Uh, that's almost seven months wages, uh, 200 days wages. And you know, imagine uh, the, uh, I, I wrote this down that the seating, compa seating capacity at One Oak Field in downtown Tulsa is 7,833 people. On special occasions, they can accommodate 9,000 people. Well, we know this crowd is 5,000 men, uh, not counting women and children. So let, let's just say it was the, the 7,833 though, and, and you work downtown and your boss comes to you one morning and says, hey, uh, One Oak Field is, is full to capacity. Every seat is filled. Um, would you please take care of lunch for them? Would you please take care of dinner for them? How are you going to do that? Uh, twice that capacity is about the capacity of Chesapeake Energy Arena in, in Oklahoma City, 18,203. There could have been 15,000 people there, men, women, and children. Um, how are we going to do that? How, are we going to spend 200 denarii? And I'm sure Judas is thinking, no, 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 no. Don't get that money out of the money bag. Uh, he had his own evil intentions for the money that was in the common treasury. Um, so Jesus just asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. It's in Luke 6 that we learn, uh, excuse me, John 6, that we learn that uh, it's Andrew who finds the, the boy with uh, the, the five small barley loaves and the, the two fish. So uh, they, they find out and they said five loaves and two fish. So Jesus directed them and all the people uh, to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. 
um, I'll keep telling you this as long as I uh, cover this text. Uh, the, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle uh, of Jesus that, that's recorded in all five Gospels. And I wish I could remember the commentator who, who says that Mark's description here of the people sitting down in, in groups of 50s and groups of hundreds on, on the green grass, he's envisioning uh, their multicolored garments and he described the scene as these multicolored jewels on a sea of emerald. I, I just love that visual imagery. And so they sit down on the green grass, probably indicating that, that it was springtime. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Um, his taking bread and giving thanks is going to have much, much more meaning later uh, in, in the Gospel of Mark. Then he gave them to the disciples, the fish and the bread, to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. And again, we, we look at the scenario, 5,000 men, not counting women and children, maybe 15,000 people, 20,000 people. This is impossible to do with five loaves and two fish humanly impossible. But as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, with man it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. I don't know what it looked like. I, I wish I knew what it looked like as Jesus began to break the loaves and the fish and to distribute it to the disciples and, and how that multiplied. But we accept by faith that that's exactly, exactly what happened. And it's not just that everybody had a little bit, everybody had a lot. Everybody ate until they were satisfied, ate until they were, they were full uh, to the extent that there were leftovers. And it's probably not incidental that there were 12 apostles and they end up with 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men that had eaten was, was 5,000. And, and you would think that if you had personally participated in something like that, I mean, if you were Andrew and found the kid with the five small barley loaves and the two fish, and then you were so tired you could hardly breathe, hardly walk, because you had been serving bread and fish all evening to these groups of 50 people, groups of 100 people, until everyone was fed, and then you picked up these baskets full of, of leftovers, you would think that there was nothing left uh, to doubt in regard to Jesus, and yet we're going to find that's exactly the case in the verses that follow. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat to go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. They're going to end up at Gennesaret, which was the other direction, which probably lets us know how contrary the wind was that night. Uh, but after leaving them, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray. If he needed it back in verse 31 of chapter 6, uh, if he needed that solitary time, he needs it far much more now. And so for the second time in Mark's gospel, we find Jesus going to a mountain to pray. Uh, and he's there at night. Earlier in Mark, we saw him going before daybreak. Uh, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake. He was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was contrary. The wind was against them. In fact, it's blowing them in the other direction. Um, shortly before dawn, so the night is spent. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. And again, it's so easy for me to read that, but I can't wrap my brain around what it would have looked like to see a human being uh, a man in his early 30s walking on the surface of a lake. Um, John's going to include in, in his uh, account of this in John 6, Peter walking on the water. Also, Mark doesn't include that, which is interesting because many people think that Mark being closely associated with Peter, um, in addition to being inspired by the Holy Spirit, got verification of many of these things from Peter. Some people suggest, well, maybe Peter didn't want Mark to tell people that, that he uh, had begun to sink in the water. I would have wanted Mark to tell people I had enough faith to get out of the boat and go walking toward Jesus. Mark doesn't include those details. Uh, so he was about to pass them by 
But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they saw him and were terrified. Um, you know, literal translation of, of the Greek, they screamed like little girls. That's not literally what the Greek text says, uh, but that's the idea I get here, that these seasoned fishing, fishermen, uh, these tough guys, including Simon the Zealot, scream like little girls when after fighting the, the wind and the waves all night, they see what they assume to be a spirit, a ghost on the water. It must be because it couldn't be a man. Nobody can walk on water. Uh, immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. It is I. In the Greek text, ego, I, and me, am. The form of, of the verb to be. Take courage. I am. Uh, I am who I am. I am that I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. You know, when, when Jesus says, I am, it means something. Uh, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And he climbed in the boat with them. The wind died down. Doesn't include a rebuke here, uh, like when he stilled the storm on the sea on the way to the region of, of the Gadarenes, when he says, quiet, hush, uh, be, be still. He just gets in the boat and the wind dies down. And then, and then it's, we're reminded that these 12 apostles were 12 human apostles. Uh, they're not there yet uh, mentally and emotionally and spiritually uh, with Jesus, not, not where they need to be. Judas is never going to get there, uh, but, but for the 11, they're still on the journey. Uh, he climbed into the boat with them. The wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. Um, th those words are, are used in other places uh, in Old Testament scripture, even on the lips of Jesus, to describe people that, that just aren't seeking the things of God. And again, uh, it's easy to be judgmental. Of, of these disciples and think, if I had seen him raise Jairus' daughter, if I had seen him feed 5,000 men with this little sack lunch, um, what was there not to get? What, what was there not to accept? Um, but they're still on the journey. They're still struggling to understand. And they're still amazed that this man can walk on water that he can bring calm to a lake just by getting in a boat. Let's quickly read verses uh, 53 through the end of the chapter, and then we'll wrap up for this morning. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. Um, Bethsaida, where they originally were headed, was to the east of Capernaum. Um, Gennesaret is to the, the south and west of Capernaum, around the other uh, around the lake shore and in the other direction. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces, the, the place where they thought Jesus would come, uh, out in the public square. And they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. Undoubtedly, they had heard the story of, of the woman who had suffered, suffered from the, the hemorrhaging disorder for 12 years. And even in her weakness, even in her anemia, she pushed her way, forced her way through the crowd just to get her hand on the edge of Jesus's cloak. And because of her faith, she was healed. Um, and the same thing here. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The only people who touched, remember all the people that were bumping into Jesus when he was on his way to Jairus's house? Um, some of them may have had some maladies, sicknesses. They weren't healed. They just bumped into Jesus. They, they weren't uh, acting in faith, but that touch of faith makes all the difference. And we reach out in faith to Jesus Christ. 
Uh, we believe that he's the son of God. We believe that he healed the sick. We believe that he cast out demons. Uh, we believe that he died and was buried and, and was raised and ascended and is coming again. And in faith, we reach out. In faith, we believe. In faith, we confess. In faith, we repent. In faith, we are baptized in his name for the forgiveness of, uh, of our sins. In faith, we begin to follow in his steps. And it, it's just incredibly encouraging to see the power of faith here and encouraging me to see the power of faith in your lives as well. Uh, thanks for coming along on, on the study again this morning. Again, I appreciate so much this opportunity to be together. I uh, look forward to our time in worship together at 10 o'clock. And uh, God bless you.